My name is Katherine Weiler. Today is May 15th, 2013, and I'm interviewing Leslie Caron for the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Visual History Program and the Screen Actors Guild. Leslie Caron is a French film actress and dancer who appeared in more than 45 films between 1951 and 2003. Her dancing and acting has enchanted and impressed audiences for years, from An American in Paris to Gigi to The L-Shaped Room to Le Divorce. She has written short stories, her memoir, and owned an inn in Burgundy. All of this in addition to her extraordinary work as a professional ballerina and as an actor on stage, television, and film. When did you first realize that you wanted to pursue ballet seriously and who, if anyone, encouraged you? My mother never stopped talking about Anna Pavlova. So I thought, if I want to attract the attention and perhaps even the love or the admiration of my mother, I had better be a dancer. Besides, it was so enticing what she told me about Pavlova, Nijinsky, uh, the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo, Diaghilev, and so on. So I just absolutely passionately wanted to be a ballet dancer. And that's what I intended to do for my whole life. What happened to me was totally uh, unpredicted and un uh, wanted, undesired. And uh, I was the f absolutely surprised by the propositions that were made to me. And did you have a sense of Hollywood growing up? Did you have an awareness of it? Mm, absolutely no desire to be a movie star. I had no, of course, I loved going to films. It was the family outing at least once a week. My mother was crazy uh, about Veronica Lake and uh, Alan Ladd. And uh, as soon as we could get American films, that is, as soon as the war was ended, because during the war, of course, there was absolutely no contact with American films. And yes, we did see a few French films, but, um, and, and yes, there were some wonderful murders, and uh, there were a few wonderful French films, but I think everything took on magic when American films came. And the glamour uh, uh, of those, the charm and glamour of the films of Veronica Lake and Alan Ladd. And eventually, when we got Gone with the Wind, absolutely thrilled me. But I never thought I would ever get involved with that. So then tell me about your discovery by Gene Kelly and your subsequent role in An American Paris. Well, I had, I was hired very young at, I guess I was 16, by Roland Petit for a season. And then they asked, could you stay on? And we started touring. Uh, this is what the Ballet des Champs-Élysées used to do. Two seasons in Paris at the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées and then toured all of Europe. and. Uh, that was, to me, extremely glamorous and great, great, great fun. Everybody was very young, and although myself and uh, Violette Verdi, we were the babies of the company, and the other members of the company took care of us. It was very family-like. And uh, anyway, we were received in embassies, we were made a fuss of. Wherever we went, there was always a king, a queen, a president. It was just fun and glamorous. And uh, uh, second season, I guess, I was something like, yeah, I was 17. I was given a, a solo 
ballet. I was starring in a ballet, which is really quite young for when I think about it. And that ballet was extremely uh, new, novel, very, very uh, surprising decor, surprising new m music written for it, composed for it. And uh, the greatest dancer in the world was my partner. That was Jean Babillet. And uh, we were doing Oedipus and the Sphinx. And guess who was the Sphinx? <laughs> And uh, I, I had no fear. I was there all, you know, all by myself in the middle of this huge stage, 2,000 people theater, and uh, having fabulous time. And what I didn't know was that Gene Kelly was in the audience. And uh, at the end of the show, huge success, applause, etc. I wanted none of that. I just took off my makeup and ran home. My apartment was very close to the theater, so I just walked. And I understand that Jean Kelly came backstage and said, where's that little girl? And couldn't find me, I was gone. Uh, so it's a year later that somebody called Eddie Constantine, Eddie Constantine, who is a big, no, he wasn't yet, became later a big star in uh, black and white, uh, uh, you know, film, murder films and detective films. His wife was sharing, uh, was a dancer and was sharing a dressing room with me. She was also premier dancers, and uh, Helen Constantine. And, uh, Eddie said, you know, Leslie, uh, Gene Kelly's coming to Paris. Who? Uh, well, he's just about the most famous dancer in America, and he's going to do a film called An American in Paris, and he'd like to meet you. Why? <laughs> well, you see, he thinks you might do, and it's fabulous Gershwin music. Who? And jazz, never heard of Gershwin, no. And I said, but I don't know anything about modern dancing. It's not my thing. But he said, well, never mind, just meet him. And so there was a meeting at the at uh, L'Hôtel de Georges V. And I thought he was very nice. And he made me read a little piece of a scene, said, I know you can dance, but I'd like to see if you could, what the sound of your voice. and." if you can, you know, emote a little bit. Okay, I did it. I thought, uh, you have to be polite. And he said, well, we're going to do a little test. Okay. So we did a little test. And I thought, oh boy, this is very cold. Great big hangar and this camera and metal and all the, those lights on me and this deadly silence, which you don't have on the stage. On the stage, you can, you can hear the public breathe. Uh, so I did the test, and I thought, OK, that's that, and forgot all about it. <laughs> and uh, then I was doing something else. I was preparing a piece of... Uh, Les Sylphides, music by Chopin, which is just so romantic and absolutely beautiful. I was all involved with that. And then I got this phone call. Hey, you've been hired. You're leaving in three days for Hollywood. <gasps> what? <laughs> and Mother said, well, you know, this is the kind of uh, offer you cannot <laughs> refuse. Oh, I didn't know what to do with myself. I cut my hair and I went and bought a piece of material and decided to make my go away dress, which I did. I did a little suit, which wasn't too bad. Um, I had a little sewing machine for babies, you know, with a little wheel. And so I, okay. And there we are at the airport, and there's a picture of us all with Eddie Constantine. 
and everybody said bye-bye. My mother came with me because I was underage, and uh, it took about, uh, I don't know, 18 hours to get to Hollywood. You had to change planes, stop everywhere, stop in London, stop in Shannon, stop in Newfoundland, stop, change planes in New York, etc. And there we arrived, and we were put in a in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Very expensive, because we were given, what, $75 for the week? And, <laughs> you know, the room was about, I don't know, maybe $15 a night. We thought, we're not going to have enough to eat. And uh, we didn't have a car, no ta you know, taxis are expensive, so. At six in the morning, the next morning, my mother said, let's pack up and go. And we left, and she told the taxi driver, take us to a cheap hotel, please, near the studio. And we ended up in, in a real, I don't know what to call it. <laughs> it was really awful. And so we were there for two, three days and didn't tell anyone. And finally, she called Jean Kelly, and hello, Jean. And he just jumped to the ceiling. What? Is that where you are? That's awful. This is where, you know, assistants take the chorus girls. You cannot stay there. So anyway, that's what my first experience in Hollywood. It wasn't by the grand door. It wasn't in a grand mansion with a swimming pool. After that, we hired, we just took a small apartment in a motel, and I stayed in a motel for about a year and a half to two years, the, the length of the film. I was this big movie star, you know, the leading parts, and living in a little motel, and coming in by the workman's entrance, because on foot. Anyway, it was... I noticed in, in American in Paris that uh, Gene Kelly has a, a wonderful introduction of himself. Uh, it all choreographed about how he gets up in the morning and moves everything Divine. around. So beautiful. But then he has an even more fabulous introduction of you yeah. with one after another of these yeah. solos. That's and Gene. That's Gene's kind heart. Gene was very thoughtful about his about me. He was very protective and he really uh, worked on giving me a fabulous introduction. And, he cer he certainly and they, they, they all cooked up the dialogue to go with it. And, and I wondered if you were even um, too naive not to realize uh, how terrific it was. It, it, uh, definitely. Definitely much too naive, I didn't. Frankly, I wasn't impressed by all that because I had gone around Europe dancing in front of royalty and huge theatres and lots of press wherever we went. So that was just one more, for me, it was just one more uh, experience. And uh, it was very hard work. Studio work is very hard work. You have to go to, uh, well, the, even the rehearsals was from nine to five. And you don't dance this much when you go to, when you're, even when you're in a ballet company. You have the class at first and then a bit of rehearsal and then you, you sleep some and then the performance and you, you're not there all the time with your two shoes on. Uh, the rehearsal period was very hard. And uh, one day I said to Jean, OK, Jean, I've done the rehearsal. Can I go home? And he said, honey, <laughs> you work from 9 to 5, and you clock out at 5 o'clock, and that's it. And I said, I was very surprised. I said, but I finished. And he said, nevertheless, you just stay there until five o'clock and then you clock out. I noticed an, another example of how unimpressed you were when 
they when you didn't like the hairstyle? <laughs> well, everybody was combed the same way at MGM. They all, you know, they thought it works on one, let's put them all with the same hairdo. Everybody has millions of little curls. And there was Ava Gardner, there was Elizabeth Taylor, there was Lana Turner, there was uh, all the girls. They all were with the same hairdo and very much the same makeup. And I thought, I'm going to surprise them, I'm going to do something new. And I'd seen this fabulous uh, model in Paris, and she had this very short hairdo like a boy. I thought, oh boy, that's terrific. That really is modern. And so I kept telling the makeup department, that's what I'd like. Yes, honey, that's all right, honey. Leave it to us. And they wouldn't do it. So the night before, I said, they don't understand. I'm going to show them. So I took my nail, cut my nail scissors and cut my hair, you know, with a little mirror. Cut in the back, I looked like I was ready for the échafaud. And, uh, well, anyway, it was a disaster. They had to postpone the shooting for two weeks, and they were wrong, because what happened the next year, uh, Shirley MacLaine did just that. She cut her hair short for the trouble with Harry, and it was considered a brand new style. And look. Talk a little bit about that. How much acting did you learn from Jean Kelly and from uh, Vincent Minnelli? Vincent was absolutely adorable, and I absolutely, I was actually quite in love with him. He was so romantic looking and, and so very sweet, a sweet man. But he was more than shy. He could not communicate, and he'd never finished a sentence. So uh, it was really up to Jean to direct me. And Jean would say, honey, turn your face to the camera, would you? That's what you're here for. <laughs> and uh, he also gave me readings, because I couldn't really speak English. And uh, I, I should say he directed me more than Vincent did. But uh, there was the presence of Vincent. Vincent had a, a natural aura of distinction and invention, and, and you did your best in front of him. Without him asking, you just... Uh, he just oozed charm and, and wit. He was very witty, actually. When he did finish a sentence, he was quite funny. So uh, there was this presence of quality, great quality, and everybody involved with the film was top, top, top quality. So uh, uh, I would take things from one or the other. Everybody was directing me and giving me good advice. Well, I know that uh, your mother got fed up and left after a few months, and then you yeah. were all alone. Yes, and I, in I my wonder, motel. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Can you describe your, your experience as a young woman uh, alone in America, and, and uh, you know, how easy was it to connect with your peers? What grounded you, sort of? Mm. What was that like it was a that very, time? very hard time for me. Uh, basically, I'm somebody who gets attached to people, and I'm not what you could call ambitious. I have a sense of duty, and my mother made it quite clear I had to be good, I had to be the best, I had to. It was a duty. And so my career was very much following, uh, uh, you know, fo following lines of duty, quality. Uh, I did enjoy acting very, very, very much, 
but the difficulty of that first film were immense. And then when I found, when the film was over, uh, the studio was nice enough to give me an English teacher, and she was a remarkable teacher from New England, had a very good semi, you know, continental accent. And uh, as a matter of fact, I hear she taught Ava Gardner to speak proper English because Ava had the thickest southern accent <laughs> when she started. And uh, so that was very exciting to me, to learn English for the several reasons. One of them was because I'd just seen Hamlet with Laurence Olivier. And, oh, that was such a beautiful sound and beautiful, the charm of that language. So my teacher said, her name was Gertrude Fogler, how do you want to proceed? Do you want to learn uh, grammar, or do you want to read, or what do you, how do you want to proceed? And I said, I want to read Hamlet. And this is how I learned English, by reading Hamlet with my teacher. But the, I also took ballet classes. Actually, I gave ballet classes, because as soon as the film was over, MGM uh, put me on layoff, as they called it. That means you were 12 weeks without salary. And, uh, you know, do as best you can. So I gave ballet classes, and uh, that was very enjoyable. I learned to drive. I bought myself a little car, and, and I was very lonely. <clears throat> I had, I would say, no friends except for Jean and his wife, Betsy, Betsy Blair, who was adorable, and their house was an open house every Saturday night. And there was André Preven, who could speak a bit French. I thought he was of French descent, but actually he was of German descent. I didn't know that then. And he took me out for dinner, gave me a camembert instead of a corsage. <laughs> and, uh, well, I tried to, you know, learn what it was to be in America, but I had just come out from the war. We were under restrictions. We had tickets for food, tickets for clothes, tickets for everything and there were queues, and jumping from that to this, this country of plenty that America was, was to me very, I felt very lonely because nobody had had this experience of mine, of seeing the German soldier in the street with the boots and the, and the gun and so on. So the, the first year, or two was difficult until I started, until they gave me another film and then another film. And I quickly found myself also a teacher to learn acting, because I thought if you have a new profession, you have to learn the technique of it. I didn't believe in it, you know, having natural genius. I thought, I think genius is a matter of work. So, I had a very, very good teacher, thanks to Betsy, Betsy Blair. That was her teacher, a German, I mean, a Russian teacher called Zhdanov. And I so enjoyed working with him, very, very much. I loved acting and learning the uh, Stanislavski method, which he had learned in Russia. And. Um I know that's a question further on. Just what was it about Stanislavski? It probably wasn't very much used in Hollywood at that time, was it? I beg your pardon. It wasn't done. It wasn't used. But it certainly was very useful for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a technique that enables you to <clears throat> express what the script demands you to express. 
It's how to uh, be the person that's on the script and how to work the script into, how to work your character into a character that lives, who is alive and has a certain demeanor, attitude, voice, rhythm, and this is what the Stanislavski method taught you. And it's, it was a absolutely fabulous technique. So uh, very quickly, on, I would say on the second film, I knew better what I was doing. I could direct myself better. Because directors don't have time on the movie set. They never have time to teach you how to act. You have to come ready. And so uh, the Stanis my teacher and I would work on the parts, on the character, and uh, on all the scenes, and break down the script so that you know which are the in-between scenes, which is your climax, where you're going to, what you're going to become, your character. So uh, that was fabulous. <clears throat> and so now we're talking about Lily. Yes, Lily, uh, we, that was an enormous uh, study. We decided she was a bit of a half-wit, and so we worked on a visual aspect of her, slightly, uh, slightly not knee and slightly bent, and, and uh, unsure of herself, and walking a bit like a duck, and a uh, bit of a stutter, and eager. <laughs> to please, and all this was worked out with my teacher, and I think this is why the film succeeded, <clears throat> and so uh, why I was nominated for the Oscar. And while I was doing the film, I didn't realize that the studio was, <laughs> was really, it, it didn't know what to do with this strange duck, we made a start of her, gave her glamour, you know, tinsel, beautiful parts, beautiful entrance into the career, and there she's playing, flat-footed, not need, uh, little orphan who can't even speak properly. And so Dory Sherry, who by then was a director of the studio, was going to shelve the film. But before doing that, he asked his wife to have a look. And his wife uh, had a look at the first cut, and she said, you know, I cried. I was very moved. I really think you ought to distribute this film. It's charming. And this is how it was shown. Lucky for them. Yes. It was enormously popular. It was an enormous success. I think it made an awful lot of money for MGM and got, I don't know how many Oscars, maybe five. And, and, and you were nominated. I mean, nominated. Yes. It, I think it only won one or two. I know the song was Branislav Kaper won the Oscar for the song, Hi Lily, Hi Leo. But we were nominated in five different, uh, I was nominated, but I was standing up next to Audrey Hepburn, who was making her sensational entrance in uh, Roman Holiday, and between an orphan and a princess. <laughs> well, then you then you won uh, for the you won the BAFTA award. I won the BAFTA, yes. And but you know, the, all those things didn't mean anything. That's for what me. I was wondering. Did, no. did it change anything? No, 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 no. In fact, I was hoping not to win because the idea of going on the stage and speaking in a microphone to say thank you terrified me so much. I, for years and years, I did sort of prepare a little phrase or two, but I was hoping not to win because I, I didn't have the courage to go up there. It took many years for me to have the courage to go up on the stage to 
accept an award. I was wondering how, after Lily, MGM let you take a break from your contract and go back to the ballet company. Y yes, they did. I asked. Holopetit asked me, uh, Leslie, do you want to come back with us and do a tour of Europe? And, and I said, wonderful. That's, that would be absolutely wonderful. And I could see the opportunity to get back into really hard training because no matter how you try, you, when you're making films, you lose your, your tough, tough, tough training. Uh, after Lily, uh, you went back to the Roland Petit Ballet. Yes. And I was just wondering if you could compare life in Hollywood with life with the <laughs> ballet. Well, we were up to, you know that film, 400 Blows? Up to no good. We were a bunch of kids. I suppose what people don't realize is that ballet dancers are usually very, very young. And ballet companies, you know, everybody's under 25. So there we were doing lots of pranks. And Roland Petit was a prankster. He was, he was up to all sorts of tricks on stage and in the hotels. And like one night we kept you know, putting shoes. The English put their shoes outside for a shine during the night, and we started putting them in first position, second position, third, fourth, and then we decided, why not change floor? <laughs> oh, Lord, at seven in the morning, there's such pandemonium. We were really severely scolded by the manager. It was, it was just... Uh, back to family life and and in those days there was no insurance and uh, when a ballet dancer got hurt and they do very often the knees uh, you know the feet and all the muscles and everything they had no money to uh, go to doctors and so we often used to give each other's, I mean, it really was almost like a communist compound. And uh, you'd give your pay, if you had parents in Paris, you would give your pay for so-and-so who had a knee problem. And uh, I don't know, that was just a natural thing. We'd, we would take care of each other. And then you went on to Daddy Longlegs. Uh, can you tell us how did you meet Fred Astaire and how did you get the role? I, well, I, we were doing, we were doing New York, we were doing Washington and so on. And during the tour, Roland said to me, uh, you're going back to make two films back to back. And the first one was The Glass Slipper. And, uh, he said, well, why don't you get the studio to hire me and the whole company? And I'll do the dancing for you, I'll be the choreographer, and the ballet company can be the, you know, in, in the film. And I asked the producer, and they said, oh, terrific. And so Roland did the first film, and the ballets in The Glass Slipper are absolutely wonderful. Uh, instead of taking place in the ballroom, Roland said, this uh, little Cinderella, she doesn't know what a ballroom looks like. She's only used to kitchens. So the ballet takes place in the kitchen and it's simply delightful with all the girls dressed as cooking maids and the boys with their hats and so on. It's just delightful. Then he said, you're going to work with Fred Astaire, my idol, do you think you could manage to put me on? So I asked again the producer who asked Fred and Fred said yes. So that's how Roland Petit got to be in that uh, film as well and I think they of course changed the script. You know, Hollywood was, was very 
uh, <clears throat> supple, and they would change the script to suit uh, whoever was in the cast. They had to. So uh, there was an occasion written in for a great ballet sequence, and uh, it was uh, there was a wonderful, wonderful nightclub, which I think is really good. Good dancing, good nightclub dancing, uh, dancing with the boys with sailors, rough guys, and so on. And I'm dancing with them on the table, and it's uh, quite dramatic. And I dance with Fred Astaire. <laughs> so that was the thrill of my life. And how is dancing with Fred Astaire different than dancing with other partners? Uh, dancing with, Fre with Fred Astaire is the easiest thing in the world. He leads you perfectly, his timing, his, you know, he, the movements are so beautiful, so right, so uh, amusing. To him, dancing was amusing, and dancing with him was amusing. You didn't have a feeling of work. It wasn't that. It was just kidding around. And I don't think many people realize but if you look at the collection of photographs of Fred Astaire, you see lots of photographs where he's monkeying around. And it's, that's a little bit what he put in his choreography. He was the greatest partner. He had this enormous hand. And he used to tell me, you know, look at my hand. Uh, of course, I couldn't be a ballet dancer with a hand like that. And he used to sort of keep together the two middle fingers to try to make his hand a bit smaller. <laughs> but this hand in your back, and you know exactly where you're going. But this was the first time for you of uh, ballroom dancing as opposed to... Yes. Ballet. Yes, yes. So... Oh, we did a number that we never rehearsed. Yeah, there was a montage of uh, montage in the script, and he had finished his day's work in one take. And the studio had s scheduled a whole day for that. And so he did it in one take, and that was it. So the assistant came to me. I was, at, uh, I was rehearsing with uh, Roland Petit. And so he said, quick, quick, get to make up, go to hairdressing, uh, you're going to, to shoot. I said, what? Everything's been shot, there's nothing. And he said, oh, Fred says you don't need to learn it. <laughs> so I slapped on the makeup and did the hair and we went straight into, straight into shooting the montage, which was going from, uh, I don't know, the, different walk, different kinds of dancing, nightclub to nightclub. We just did it without rehearsing it. Are there things that you learned from him that you took uh, with you through your career? Well, you, you learn things. I guess you learn things by osmosis, I don't remember, except he was extremely uh, I don't want to say rigid, but uh, uh, serious about timing and about finishing and don't wobble. Don't wobble. So <laughs> he used to say things that were not always very kind about uh, Ginger on that, <laughs> on, on that subject. But, uh, and the other thing he told me is, is please, no feathers, you know, it, because the ginger had had this dress with feathers. And I said, no, 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 I won't have feathers. But, uh, so, uh, what did I learn? I learned timing. Yes, I learned timing. I did learn timing. But I learned timing from him before that because when I was a little girl in Paris uh, learning ballet, my mother would send me to, or we would go to see Fred Astaire films, and uh, she would say, watch his timing, watch his rhythm. 
he's absolutely the best for that. As against the French uh, ballet uh, à l'opéra, who is still not quite up to that. If you found your balance on top of your toe, uh, usually girls stayed there, even if the music went on. <laughs> and my mother said, no, 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 you just go, it's the music that leads you. And Fred was uh, just a genius about that. He played with the music, he, he, he was, uh, he just, the music was inside him. And he, I would say he was like, like a black man. He had this sense of rhythm and this sense of movement with the rhythm. The body expressed what the music said. And what can I tell you? That's the great thrill of dancing with Fred Astaire. You talk about how you came to the film version, of the, the role of Gigi, the film version. Ah. Well, um, as I said to you before, I was the laughing stock of the studio when I was doing Lily, to the point that uh, Arthur Freed, the great producer who brought me to Hollywood for An American in Paris, uh, heard about it and came to see me on the stage of Lily and said, my poor darling, see what they're doing to you. Uh, I'd better do another film with you to save your career. I tried to make you glamorous and all that and uh, look at what they're doing to you now. <laughs> uh, I was very surprised. And he said, let me, we should do another film together. All right. I didn't uh, pay attention to what he said. I was very, you know, opinionated. I didn't pay attention to what he said about, uh, look at what they're doing to you now. I thought I was doing fine. But uh, I heard I'd like to do another film with you. And so I came up, he said, any ideas? And I came up with one or two ideas, and one of them was Gigi, which Audrey Hepburn was doing the play of on Broadway. And I had read the story. I'm a great fan of Colette. And so I mentioned that. And he said, aha, hmm, I'll get back to you on that. And he disappeared. He would never come on the stage, usually. As somebody very discreet. But he thought my career was really in jeopardy. So uh, it took him a year and a half or something to get the rights. And there was, I believe, also a problem of censorship because after all, it is the education of a cocotte. Uh, so uh, Alan, Alan J. Lerner was a very, very distinguished uh, scriptwriter and very elegant, too. He could never do anything vulgar. So he wrote a first script, which wasn't a musical, and it was excellent absolutely charming. But exactly at the same time, the French film came out, and that was far darker. It wasn't a comedy, and it didn't have the scintillation and so on. And I think for those two reasons, Arthur Free decided to make a musical out of it, to drown the fish, as we say in French. Uh, nobody's going to think there's anything dirty about it because it's a musical, and they'll forget the fact that she's being educated to be a cocotte. And then it'll also uh, be considered far better than the French film, 
because it'll be far more glamorous. So the first script was good, then I had a baby, and then the second script was ready. <laughs> uh, but they stayed with me, and uh, uh, I was really so, so, so thrilled with this character because I still had a great deal of childhood in me. And uh, it's hard to believe, but I was 26 when I did Gigi. I was hardly a little girl, and I was a mother. I have a picture of me presenting my little boy to Maurice Chevalier, who lifts his hat, and uh, I'm dressed as Gigi, and it's quite funny. But uh, I had no problem playing the little girl, no problem at all. I simply loved the vivaciousness and the charm of uh, her childhood. And uh, I relished every moment of that film. It was a pure joy. And working with Vincent was just so wonderful. He had so much a sense of elegance and rhythm and vivacity and brilliance. And he was also very interested in that period. And then they had the great, great, fabulous idea of asking Cecil Beaton to do the costumes. And Cecil Beaton was the best in the world for that period. He knew everything about uh, makeup and how the clothes had to be cut and the materials and how you carried off and how you placed your hat. You know, you go on a period film and you find the all the uh, uh, the extras wanting to be seen, so the hat is too far back. No, no, no. V uh, Cecil Beaton was there every morning at before nine, at eight o'clock, and he would put the hats where they should be. Also, he did the flowers and so on. I'm not talking about all the others, but. Uh, Maurice Chevalier was just delightful, and, and uh, I, as the years go by, I have a bigger, bigger admiration for Louis Jourdan, whom I think was, uh, was so delightful, was such a good singer, his voice is so caressing and charming, and he's just right, he's just so good. Uh, there must have been some real challenges also making this film, shooting a musical on location in real sets. I don't know if that had ever been done before. Uh, I think uh, maybe On the Town had something to do with New York, but not much. In those days, the studio did not like to face the elements and the hazards of a real town and uh, the weather, the sound, and all those problems, they much preferred doing, reconstructing a whole town in the back lot. So yes, it was, uh, I believe, something very novel and very daring, but the sets were so unique, you couldn't, it was very difficult to reproduce uh, 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 Le Palais de Glass and Maxime's, uh, Le, Le Luxembourg or whatever. No, it wasn't the Luxembourg. Oh, yes, I play in the Luxembourg. But the gardens were all right. We could have done that in Hollywood. But there, was, there were lots of uh, sets that were unique. The houses, the house of Aunt, great, great Aunt Anita was unique architecture. Now, by this time, you had married and had children. Just, just, just my baby. Just one. one. Yes. But uh, how did that? How did you manage to balance that with your work life? Ah, that became a problem. No, the problem was uh, when my when I had two children, when my daughter was born, and I did Fanny, for instance, in the south of France. 
that was easy. There was a nurse and we had plenty of space. We had ample apartments in, in uh, Nice and Marseille and so on. But the difficulty was the marriage uh, because my husband, Peter Hall, had, uh, was a very ambitious young man who had to fulfill his talent and his career. And he simply wasn't the kind of husband to follow his movie star wife. So I was again alone for long periods and that became very difficult for him and for me. And eventually that is what broke us up. I was ready to give up my movie career for him, but he wasn't ready to have me on as a, as a stage actress. Uh, and the first time I went on the stage, uh, I didn't have a voice I didn't have a voice worked out enough for the stage. It, it is another uh, venue, and you do need to work on that. You have to know how to project your voice. And uh, I didn't know, and I didn't also have the, the strong <coughs> shoulders that you need to be on the stage. You need to be very... Uh, forceful, and you need a lot of character on the stage. And I was still very shy. <laughs> and it was so he did not want me on the stage in his work. Also, it was the beginning of what you would call, uh, you know, the, the working class plays. Uh, and I think he started choosing actors who had provincial accents, North Country, Irish, Scottish, uh, Warwickshire accents. And if you, a French accent just didn't go. So it, we were more and more apart and, and that's what happened, we were just, uh, we saw that it wasn't working. I cried an awful lot for him to accept me as an actress in his place, but he wouldn't. He did one play with me, which was uh, Ondine, and I think that was quite good, but uh, you, de you do need a lot of training on the stage, I think, and it took a lot of work for me to get uh, enough courage to consider more stage work. And um, actually, with Gigi, the film won nine Oscars, was a huge success, although you didn't win an Oscar for this role, uh, but certainly... I wasn't was even nominated. Well, that's one of those... Uh, mistakes <laughs> thought, that they happen a lot at the Academy, I've noticed. Well, I think I did it so well, they thought I was, uh, I, that was me. <laughs> they didn't realize I was oh, acting. Oh, maybe, yes. Um, but um, do you think of it as one of your best? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. And I think it's quite, uh, it's quite good to be, uh, to have been able to go from a little girl of 14 to a young lady of 18, 20 who, who gets married. I, I don't think many actresses had either the opportunity or realized that. I just had this particular talent at that time. I was able to portray very young girls when I was not really. So at that point, uh, or soon after, um, you had done The Glass Slipper, you had, um, but you, you decided to stop dancing. And you, uh, you, you said it in your memoir that uh, you felt your best dancing was in The Glass Slipper and in Daddy Long Legs. Yes. But, but you really stopped dancing then. Well, I could not keep both together. I 
would not consider doing uh, dancing badly, that is, toe dancing badly, uh, be inferior. So uh, one or the other had to go, either the acting or the dancing. Either I had to work seriously and take two hours of ballet a day and then go with a ballet company or give it up. I did not want to lower my standards, so I went to see Jean Renoir, who was a great friend, and uh, I asked him his advice. Uh, I was still on the contract then, I think, but I asked him what he thought I should do, and he said, well, I don't know about your dancing, I don't know anything about ballet, but I think you, you are an actress. And he wrote a play for me to, to help me become an actress and to teach me how to act on the stage. And uh, that was an absolutely wonderful experience. A uh, great, great man. And uh, so rich in his, you know, this family had this aura of greatness. It just came naturally. Uh, the, and he was very philosophical and very concerned with history and with human behavior. And also a great sense of humor. And somebody extremely free, he was like a free horse who'd never been mounted, had never been tamed. And he thought absolutely nothing uh, of having on one side of the stage a girl who's dying of peritonitis and on the other stage really clowning characters. He saw, he thought life was both uh, comedy and drama. So, he, he, you know, there was no rigid rule with him. There was, there was always one side of life and the other. And so so that was just a terrific five months I spent doing the play and rehearsing. And we did it in Paris in French. What was the title? Orve. The title was Orve. And Orve is the name of a little garden snake. Inoffensive, but uh, very swift and very uh, free. Uh -huh. And my first line on the stage was, was something I, I still remember people going, <gasps> you know, she comes in with, uh, with some mushrooms in a, in a, she's just a little ragamuffin, and she comes in with, with a, mushrooms in a handkerchief and says, you want to buy my mushrooms? And the writer says, no, thank you. And she said, she says, uh, okay, do you want to sleep with me? <laughs> and in those years, that, that sentence said like this, bluntly, was considered rather shocking. Um, the, the, another thing that you said in your memoir, you mentioned that uh, Hollywood uh, in general, and MGM specifically, played a part in, de in delaying your maturity. Can you sort of elaborate on that? I think that is the problem of our child performers. It's not just me, but, well, MGM was very protective. You, it was, first of all, they wanted to keep you in infancy as long as they could, and then, uh, Maturity was a threat. Any kind of adult behavior and independence was a threat to the good functioning of the studio. They wanted nice children. And so uh, there came a point where I realized I was just, uh, you know, if I had listened to MGM, I would have just gone on being a an adolescent forever. And I wanted to have the experience of life. 
So I wanted to break my contract. May have been rather silly, but I was not uh, ready to just go on being an adolescent forever. So um, now we're entering into the 60s and 70s. You've left the studio system, and uh, how is your life ordered now without that? Uh, it was not easy. <clears throat> uh, my, you know, there are big holes in my life <laughs> that I don't remember too much what I think, uh, first of all, there was a heavy fight to let me go. And the outcome was that I would do two more films for MGM and I was free. But I was hoping to be doing films in France with Francois Truffaut, for instance, who was a great friend. And I wanted to expand my experience, uh, which was very naive of me. You really cannot just go right and left and right and left. And, you know, you have to choose a line, usually. As a matter of fact, nowadays there are some actresses who can play ideal women, love interest, and villains, and I'm talking about Meryl Streep, naturally. It is unique. In those days, you couldn't even do that, let alone do a film in another country. So I came back to England, and uh, there was, well, there was the L-shaped room, actually, which was a, a, a fabulous, fabulous project and absolutely wonderful part and I was thrilled as can be. The part was written for an English girl and the press was very hostile when they learned that Jimmy Wolf, the producer, had chosen this French actress gone Hollywood, this French girl gone Hollywood. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I won the, Os the British Oscar, the, ba the BAFTA. Uh, and that was a grand experience, my first grand dramatic part. And that's what I wanted to do. I knew I had it in me to, to play dramatic parts as well, not just, you know, nice uh, comedies. So uh, I really dug my teeth into that part. So talk a bit about how you prepared for that role. It was so different from your previous one. Uh, I had to, I, I think mostly I let myself be directed by Brian Forbes. I said to Brian, listen Brian, in Hollywood, you had to smile every time a camera was on you. I count on you to direct me uh, straightforward in dramatic moments, dramatic parts. It's difficult for me because my education so far has been to be charming. You've got to wipe out the charm and get me to really be realistic and dramatic when the scene demands it. And I worked very, I think I was the first actress to actually show a nine months old belly, pregnant woman belly. Uh, and uh, I remember one of the uh, journalists, Hedda Hop, not Hedda Hop, but another one came on the set and saw me burst into the scene, for, for the scene, with a, this nine months. I remember her intake of breath. She was shocked. 
because in Hollywood, when you were pregnant, you just had a loose shirt, but there was hardly anything behind. This was the first time you would walk waddled like a duck and show yourself uh, in really, for a Hollywood star, this was quite daring. Uh, and I think it was my last black and white film. And I had a great uh, cameraman. Uh, but, uh, and I had a great partner. I had a wonderful, wonderful actor as a partner. And uh, right now my brain goes Tom dead. Bell. Tom Bell. Yeah, talk about him a, a bit. Tom Bell was the bright, young, up and coming uh, actor. He was acting in uh, Stratford East, communist, you know, straight drama, uh, real English, uh, dramatic uh, plays, and in the slums, all that. So he was uh, a very different actor from the charming actors I'd been acting with. He had none of the Cary Grant or the Henry Fonda polish. He was a boy from the East End and had the East End accent and so on. But what a good actor. He was really, really excellent. And it was a real joy to play with somebody like this who has no hold, who doesn't hold anything back. Uh, he should have been nominated too. It was unfair not to nominate him. And 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 uh, tell me a little about working with Jimmy Wolf. Ah, oh, Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy was a grand seigneur. Was was a prince. He his business went on in grand restaurants. He would take you to the best restaurant in the most expensive restaurant and he would give you the menu and say what you want. And he told me about Martita Hunt, who would go on the wine list. She would go and take the one that was the most expensive, <laughs> not knowing necessarily what the wine was. But And anyway, he was, he was full of stories about uh, those girls who know how to get things from men, and he was trying to get my education going. He thought I was far too modest. You know, I was married to, also to a man who was doing serious theater, who was doing Waiting for Godot. And that's not Hollywood, that's the opposite of Hollywood. So, uh, it, it, gosh, it was, Difficult, but my I was quite serious, quite uh, earnest, and uh, I really wanted to play this part as it should be played, with real drama. I mean, I I looked up to uh, Anna Magnani and wanted to give the sort of performance that they were giving, that she was giving. So I think that Jimmy Wolf took me to great restaurant to counterbalance the dourness of this part. I remember one night we had to film late at night and we were in the east end of London, this real, real slums where it was actually dangerous. Uh, a, a girl couldn't walk there alone. She would be in, in, pro in trouble. And we were told to be extremely quiet because somebody was dying in the front room. And we had to, I had to do walk up the steps and get in. That's all I had to do in this street scene. But it, uh, you know, it just froze your blood to think uh, what real drama was going on in these streets. It was, England was very down in those days. And they, 
the slums were really slums. So we worked in the slums, in the streets. Uh, the interiors, of course, were at Shepparton, which is quite not as glamorous as Hollywood, but uh, had seen some quite a lot of glamour. But uh, and I was dressed. First in Dior, I had Dior clothes to begin with, and then when she decides to keep and have her baby, I was dressed in the five at ten cent store. I had real hand-me-downs, and uh, I think for my uh, that scene where I am uh, about to have the baby, I was wearing my oldest uh, house robe, which really was. <laughs> I threw it away at the end of the film. <laughs> wonderful actors and a wonderful direction with, with Brian Forbes. And he had such a knack for, for dialogue, for the right dialogue, the right sounds, the right rhythm of dialogue. He was very, very good. And, uh, and certainly you ended up with this, your second nomination, Oscar nomination, and the BAFTA, and the yes. Golden Globe. Um, did the success of the film and your work in it, did that impact your, your life and work after? No. Somehow I knew that getting uh, the BAFTA was uh, like nailing the lid on my coffin. I knew England would never ask me again. There was this sort of, well, okay, we've given her the BAFTA, and that's what she, she deserved it, but that's it, we don't want to hear about her again. And I was never offered, I think, I don't think I was, uh, until years and years and years later when uh, I did, uh, uh, what are they called, those television films, B, uh, BEO, or whatever it's called, uh, 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 the last of the long bombshells. Uh, oh yes, Th that was That's fun. Very much later. Very much later. No, uh, it's it's sort of cooled down. I I don't know. Maybe there was a resentment hmm. that uh, a French girl who's done a career in Hollywood should earn the BAFTA that year. I don't know, but I was not asked again. Now, there's so many films in your career. Then I went Polish. <laughs> well, that's what I want. You know, uh, I thought I would just mention a few. Of course, there's the Zanussi films. Yes. Uh, well, talk a bit about working with Zanussi. Absolutely wonderful. Zanussi is an intellectual. He is a man who can speak five languages completely, currently, you know, what, whatever the word is, just fluently. And he uh, wasn't too good on English. And of course, uh, my Polish doesn't exist. So everybody was talking Polish, he was directing in Polish. And uh, here we were on the Russian camp. It was very heavily Russian. And the first thing he said when I arrived in Warsaw was, be careful where you talk, be careful what you say. Every door has somebody, a near behind. Don't be, be very careful or they'll stop the film or they'll send you off. Or it was, we were in, in the uh, Cold War there and Poland was treated with a great uh, contempt by the Russians, of course. They, it was very difficult getting permission to be at the Opera House, to film in the Opera House, or to film in the streets. The Russians would put a veto on everything. But wonderful actors. I mean, your, your walk-on can play Hamlet. They're absolutely breathtaking actors. And uh, Zanussi, of course, was 
maybe not a great script writer in he, he said, write your own script, because I can't, I don't know, write your own dialogue. So I did, and uh, he said, and bring your clothes, because we have no clothes here. And there, were, there was absolutely nothing. It was this period when there, were, there was one raincoat for sale in the whole country, as in Russia as well. Uh, there was no choice of anything. And there was absolutely no, he said, bring your makeup, bring everything, because we have nothing. And he, what's more, he said, and only one take, we don't have enough film. That your father would not have liked that, <laughs> he wouldn't have survived there. But it was a real adventure. It was an adventure. And I played the game. Uh, there was a lot of improvisation. And there was one scene where I suppose I'm supposed to come into the wedding party. So everybody's sitting tightly around a large table. And I'm supposed to come. I'm this uh, flash European spoiled woman. And I'm supposed to come and sit in this uh, luncheon. And I couldn't sit in. I couldn't pull the chair back. I tried to pull the chair back. I thought, what, what do I do? The camera was turning, and I thought, I can't just... I could do it, but it just wasn't in the character to, over, to jump over. So I stopped. And he said, you stopped, Leslie, you stopped. I said, I said what can I do? I can't, Christoph, I can't get in. And this was the way it was. We only had one take. And he used to say to me, you know, the world, all the critics, they go into ecstasy because some parts are black and white, some parts are in color. We go black and white because we have no more film. So we have to take the rest of, you know, in black and white. So this is, we do all the important scenes in color. And then we run out of pellicule. Of, of, and so we, we take whatever we can. We go and steal the leftovers. Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> now, among the actors that you worked with at the time, uh, there was Cary Grant. Oh, Mark. gosh. So I'll just name a few, and if you'll just give me a little reaction, that would be great. A memorable <sighs> moment, a challenge with a scene, whatever. Uh, Cary Grant? Cary Grant was... You can't forget having worked with Cary Grant. It's unforgettable. His absolute wit, his knowledge of the public, his manipulation of the public while acting is absolutely wonderful. This eye was just twinkling throughout absolutely divine to work with him. And Warren Beatty? Warren was a very, very good technician. He taught me a lot. He said, if you don't know what to do in the scene, invent a business, business, business. Either you're doing that or, or you're pouring a glass, always be have two businesses, your lines and a business. And so you will never find yourself, uh, you know, lacking in purpose. Mm. You've got to have two purposes going on. One, and that's uh, the acting studio, that's uh, Stanislavski. And he said, and don't uh, do the business uh, any old how concentrate on the business you're doing. Like you're pouring tea, really pour tea, and make sure your t cup is where it should be, full. And I get so mad when I see actors pretending to, to pour tea and it's not done properly. They think of their line. No, you pour tea, you pour tea. And the same with everything. And so he was a great teacher. How about Orson Welles? <gasps> Orson Welles 
wanted me to do exactly the opposite of what the director wanted me to do. The director wanted me to go into great big dramatic uh, drama, uh, you know, enormous, enormous. Uh, and Orson uh, was telling me on the plate, do exactly the opposite, go real inexistent. So that was very interesting, but I couldn't do it. However, in the big, big scene where my husband is killed under my eyes by the Gestapo, uh, that was quite an experience. We're talking about the film, Is Paris Burning? And uh, the director, René Clément, came to me before the scene and he looked at me in the eye and he kissed me on both cheeks and walked away behind the camera. Didn't say anything. Just looked at me and kissed me, like kiss, kissing me goodbye. It was something. <sighs> it was something. And I said to him, I cannot do it more than once. It's going to upset me so much I, will, I know I will never be able to do it more than once. So be ready. So there were three cameras, four. And I really let it rip. And, uh, and the scene is good. Um, I know you enjoyed the Italian film, Il Padre yes. di Famiglia. Il Padre di Famiglia, with Nanny Loy wonderful, wonderful Italian director who was head of the uh, of uh, the school of uh, what is it called? Experimental cinema school. So he was a teacher as well. He knew everything about camera, about cutting, about acting. He was a great actor. And he is the only director I ever worked with who uh, just believe that you should film with a flow. And that only Italians can do that because they don't care about the sound. The sound is just a, a witness sound. And uh, in any case, they're going to write the script after. <laughs> they take whatever they have on, on the film and they write the script according to your movements, your mood, and the length of your words. But of course, I was acting in English, and everybody else was acting in Italian. I didn't speak Italian. So that was just a funny, funny, wonderful experience. But I think the film is very good. And I had two, I had two and a half great uh, actors with, with me. We started with Toto, and Toto died after three days. So it was Tognazzi who played his part, and we had to go back and play his, the beginning of, the, of his part. And then Manfredi, who was absolutely wonderful, good actor. But he didn't know a word of English, <laughs> and I didn't know any Italian. And I remember we played a love scene in the bed. He was there, I was here, and the first assistant was lying on the ground with a white handkerchief, which he would uh, raise when it was about to be my time to speak. And that's how we did it. And I, the bottom of my eye could catch this white flag. And then I would go and just punch my lines with Tognazzi and the same with him. It, isn't that something? Could you imagine that films are made like this? Amazing. Well, it worked. It worked. That scene is absolutely gripping. It's a husband and wife at each other. And you can't imagine this assistant sitting on the floor, with, lying on the floor with his white handkerchief. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see that as soon as I get home. And then, finally, Valentino with Nureyev. Oh, yes. And Ken Russell. And Ken Russell. Wonderful, wonderful, Ken Russell. Except Ken had one 
floor. He wanted everything to be a climax. And so we went from one climax to another climax to another climax and again. And uh, I think it's John Ford who said, let them rest in between the big scenes. Just let them relax, let the public relax. So uh, it's a wonderful film, but too many climaxes. And uh, we, it was, it's rather operatic. He just let us loose and said, now go ahead and give your all. And uh, it's, uh, it was a time when the American public wanted realism. So the film didn't do well at the box office. And I'm very, very sorry for Rudolf because he wanted to have a film career. He could feel it was, he was getting close to the end of his dancing career and he would have liked to make more films. And he was a very sensitive actor and a very quick learner. He was a genius. He was, his intelligence was just unbelievable. He caught on very quick that when the cameras close, you slow down, you, 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 you play smaller. When the camera is far, you play bigger. So he caught on to that very quickly. And he would do the same with his voice. And, but uh, the director didn't help him and so he felt unhappy about, I don't know why, he was, he was lovely as Valentino. He's wonderful. Well, I have to thank you because I grew up in L.A. and there was this strange and wonderful place called the Garden of Allah. And I always thought it was Allah. I didn't realize it was Allah Nazimova. Nazimova. Yes. She had bought it, if you read Gavin... Uh, Lambert's Lambert. biography on Ala Nazimova. You get all the details about that <coughs> incredible mansion with all the little bungalows that she built around, and that was her home. <coughs> and then at the end of her career, when she lost every penny she had made, and God knows she had been paid fortunes, fortunes. She was earning $5,000 a week in 1920. Uh, well, she ended up just in one of the bungalows. Everything else was sold. But, and the enormous, the strange thing about this actress was that she came from Moscow, from the Stanislavski teaching, directing, uh, Chekhov plays. She came on Broadway and was the a furor on Broadway for her under understated acting, realistic acting, the real acting you should have in Chekhov, with the pauses and everything. And then she goes to Hollywood, and they give her uh, silent films to play in. And nobody overacted more than she did. I mean, she's all over the place, overacting. However, some friends of mine have saw, seen her uh, on the stage in, on Broadway and said she was sensational. Uh, and it was fun playing her. A, um, a sort of a political question. How challenging was it as a female actor at this time in terms of barriers, sexism, glass ceiling, all that sort of thing? Uh, at first, very difficult. At first, we were Barbie dolls, all of us. We were just considered uh, beautiful objects and stupid, you know. We, 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 you didn't have you, a word to say about the script, and you, 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 were, you were not uh, considered like a intelligent human being. There was a, an enormous chism between women and men. And so I found that quite difficult to deal with, to begin with. And then uh, 
little by little, as the years went on, when the women's lib was created and so on, it became easier. And, and now it's the upper hand is in the is in the women's camp. <laughs> So when did you move back to Paris? So my husband decided that things were happening in Paris and we should go to Paris to film. And uh, I sold the house I had just decorated in Bel Air, beautiful house. <coughs> and we came to Paris and he he just didn't adapt to Paris. He didn't find it uh, comfortable. So after two weeks, he said, we're going back again to Los Angeles. <sighs> and I said, no, not me. So I stayed. I stayed and I decided, uh, I suppose my career is finished. I'm, I was by then, I think, 40, and that was the age when careers were over. 40, that's it. So I started trying to write, and I wrote a script, and my friend in those days was Francois Truffaut. He very, very kindly took me out to dinner every two, three weeks. And uh, that's about the only person I would see. I was very, very lonely in those uh, something like two years. And uh, there wasn't, uh, that was, I thought that's the end of my career. I better learn to do something else, like write. And I, I don't know how I got out of it. I can't remember what happened that took me out of this phase. But uh, things start again, and I realize that it's never over, and that uh, you can be a star at 80. <laughs> I'm, I was never, never more surprised, and that just shows how the world has changed. Emmanuel Riva getting uh, the British BAFTA, the French Oscar, or César, it's called, and being nominated in Hollywood is just unheard of. It's just absolutely wonderful. And it opens the windows to all the women. And it permits you to, to age. And it just shows that with age and experience, you get better, not worse. And a lot of the public is really very interested in in the emotions can be that can be portrayed by somebody older. So how did I I don't remember what happened after. Did uh, I go well back then, to uh, London? Did I go back to Hollywood or did uh, no I stayed no, here. You stayed here I and stayed then here there came the stage productions. Uh, in 1984, Can Can, On Your Toes, One for the Tango, I was knocked out by the idea yes. that you replaced Makarova on point and on your toes. Yes! <laughs> I went back to toe work. I mean, that's unbelievable and I don't know, I, I should be in the, in the Guinness Book of Records for having done that because I think I was in my 50s then, and I went back to toe work. And the muscle training you need to get on your toes, on one toe, it's okay if you're on both legs, but just one, demands such a structure of muscles all the way up and down from your, you know, from your neck down. It's unbelievable, but I did. And, uh, <clears throat> I did the tour. Yes, I did a lot of uh, musicals on tour. That I was offered. That's what I was offered. So I did them. And uh, it was fine. But that, uh, just to stick with that on your toes thing, um, to be able to do that, it seems to me, means that you must have been extremely diligent about practice all those years, since 1950 yes. 
too. I never stopped. I have a bar. You have a bar right in, in the my hall. Yes. Entrance, and I did the bar every single morning. <clears throat> I simply did the bar every day until I did a restaurant in Burgundy. But I continued my training, and but that's not enough to get back on your toes. When I, uh, they offered me that part with a great deal of money, I said, my back isn't all that great, I have pain. And I said, I'm going to see my uh, chiropractor, and if he says, no, no, uh, the, the ones with the needles, what's it called? Acupuncturist. Acupuncturist. I'm going to go see my acupuncturist, and if he says he can get rid of that pain, I will say yes. And he said, yes, in three sessions we will be. Okay. And three sessions, and I had no more pain. So I accepted it, and I went back into really hard training. And what I would do is get up in the morning, breakfast, uh, the bar, uh, and toe work, start toe work. <clears throat> then I would have lunch, and then I didn't have a dog then, so I didn't have to walk my dog. I would have lunch, I would sleep, and do it again. I would do three bars a day, and three times I would have to sleep in between. It was very, very strenuous. And how long is a bar? A bar is about 40 minutes. Wow. And then the toe work would be about 15 minutes. And every day I would, I would try to go on one toe instead of both and have the strength and have the muscles to go on one toe. And uh, when I arrived, uh, George Abbott was the director. I mean, George Abbott was 95. <clears throat> he had just got married, gotten married the year before. And he had done this musical some 50, 60 years previously, <laughs> and a few times since. Uh, so he directed me, and my partner was a little rough, and he threw me over his shoulder, you know, sort of like that. And I heard snap, and I said to George Abbott, uh, I'm afraid he's broken my rib. I'm afraid my rib is broken. Oh, no, said he. I said, I think so. So I had to go to the hospital. They did a scan, and they said, yes, it's broken. So I said, uh, I'll be back very quickly. And uh, I just didn't move. And you know, when you have broken rib and the telephone rings, it's absolute hell. You have to, all in one piece, roll over, manage to sit and grab it. The pain is just awful. And I would go to uh, 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 those water bubbling, what's it called? Spa? Uh, yes, the spa where they have those, uh, what is it called? The water bubbling. It's hot and it's, okay. So I'd sit in there and the pain was abominable. The pain was just terrible. But I did that every single day and I was back within 20 days and the doctor couldn't believe it. I, I was back but I could not do the toe work on one. I could do it on... I couldn't really do the toe work so I did all the rest and the toe number was done and Makarova came back. She did uh, a few performances. <clears throat> and then my understudy would do that little toe ballet. And then came the day when I could do it. And I remember all my chums were lying on the floor and sort of in the wings, watching me, to, you know, to see if I could do the two turns on my toe. 
And I did it, and there was a sort of howl that the whole audience, <laughs> the whole audience heard this, bravo! <laughs> and uh, I finished. I continued the tour, but they had done something very stupid. Instead of having a hard floor, they had a lino floor, and a soft lino over a very old wooden floor where there are potholes is not possible for ballet, for toe sho shoes. And uh, one night I twisted my ankle and fell. And uh, it's actually, that was okay. I went back on toe the next day, but um, I, I had an, another accident. My, my partner had to lift me up and I landed on one foot, and uh, I heard the, the ligament give way. It's like torn material. No pain, just tore, just torn. I suppose if they quarter you, that's what it feels like. And uh, I finished the number on one foot, took my curtain call on one foot and was sort of carried off and I said it's it's torn and that was the end of the tour. They took the yeah, the hospital and so on. However, that was not the end <laughs> of courageous moments. <laughs> In my opinion, um, there was a singing number. Uh, the first time you sang. Oh yes, in Berlin, in Grand Hotel. Yes, a nightmare for me. And I thought, I can't accept that. I can't accept it. I can't sing. And then I went and bought the records of the actresses who had done it before. And uh, the first actress who played the part was Hermione Gingold. <laughs> To say she couldn't sing is under, you know, is underplaying it. She really cannot sing, and she couldn't even keep the rhythm. But it didn't matter. She was great. There was a, this wonderful experience, this wonderful actress. And I thought, well, if she could do it, so can I. So I said, OK. And I got the greatest... Uh, reviews I've ever had in my life for that part. That's just so terrific. How about Damage with Jeremy Irons and Louis Mal? Yes, and Juliette Binoche. Absolutely uh, wonderful to work with uh, Louis Mal. Just a great director, very, very, very sensitive. And, you know, to finely tune director with, he just had to be exactly right. Many takes and from all angles, many, many times. And it was a wonderful, <clears throat> dramatic part. And uh, I will not say who I copied myself on, but uh, I, it was, it was, uh, quite difficult to do. I don't like playing horrid women. I really don't. It's, it, it hurts me. It hurts me. It's painful. And I would so much rather be lovable. But uh, when you've got to do it, you've got to do it. And Jeremy was a wonderful actor, so was Juliet. And Juliet was surprising. She couldn't speak a word of English when she came in. And by the end of the film, it was, she was perfect. She was just staggering. Uh, really very talented actress and a wonderful ear. The film is quite dramatic. It's like a, a Greek uh, tragedy. 
Then you played smaller roles in Chocola, which I just saw, and I just have a, another question about that. Did you by any chance do the narration? No. There's, there's a voiceover that um, seemed to me to be, uh, just, you know, to have a, an echo of your voice, but okay. Well, that is funny that I was supposed to play the part that Judy Dench played. Uh -huh. I was offered that, and I said, yes, I'll do that. I, they had offered it to Judy before, first. Judy was uh, very, very uh, successful at that time, which she still is, and uh, her husband was desperately ill, so she first said yes, and then she said, no, I don't want to leave England because my husband's too ill. So at that point, they offered me that part. And I said, wonderful, yes, thank you. And then Judy said, well, on the other hand, or rather they moved the location and decided to do uh, very little in France but Bath, to use the lake and the water in Bath, England. And so she could do the part. And I was uh, quite, disappointed, but my agent said, you know, Leslie, there's another little part. It's much smaller, but you get your man at the end. <laughs> Why don't you accept that? And so I said, okay, I'll do it. I didn't ask you about Johnny Depp. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Smooth, irresistible. Yes. Irresistible, very charming. And you know, uh, real talent. He came uh, with a bunch of crudies on the set, and he was asked, the, the song you sing in the, in the film, uh, can you make it up? He just made it up. He made it up with his charms and just, just like that. Absolutely amazing, and it was good. Wow. Well, he's, a, he's a good good actor, good musician. Yes. And a very charming person. I'm sure of that. <laughs> so what led you to begin writing your book? Thank heavens. I always thought I ought to, I have to. I've worked with, I've known so many great people. And I knew I could write because I had written uh, a book of short stories, which got very good reviews. So uh, I knew I owed to my great partners and friends. And uh, I decided, well, now's the time. It's now or never. So I started, and it was very difficult at first. But strangely enough, like with everything, the more you write, the the, be the quicker it comes. And uh, it did take me two years, two years, all day long. I did nothing but that for two years. I didn't do any acting. I, did. I, I worked quite, quite hard. But I felt a sense of accomplishment and a great sense of catharsis. It, I looked at all the films I'd done and the plays, and the radios, and the narrations, and I thought, hmm, it is a body of work. I suppose I could say I am an actress, because I always thought I'm, I'm just a pretend actress. I'm really a dancer who never fulfilled her career, and, you know, I never thought I amounted to very much in acting. And then seeing all that, and I had to look at some old films of mine in order to write about them, because my publisher said, Leslie, it isn't enough just to say you did such a film. You have to give us a bit of the plot, because your readers uh, may not have seen those films, you know, <laughs> it's a way back. So I saw the films again and thought, hmm, 
such and such a film, which I thought was absolutely terrible. No, no, I, this, you know, I didn't do badly there. And so it was very rewarding, finally. Then uh, my book of short stories was translated into French. I wrote it in English again, but it was translated into French by a very, very good translator. And she did a splendid job. I didn't have to go over it. And I thought this is going to be the same. But I'm afraid it wasn't. The translator had no idea about filming and about the movie world and about Hollywood or America. And the translation was sometimes just way off. And I said to my <coughs> publisher, I'm afraid I cannot let that go. I know you won't make a fortune on this book, and neither will I, but I cannot let that go. It's just way off, way off. And the writing was elaborate, formal, and uh, I thought it, it, it's not the way I write. It's not the way I want to present my, myself. So I had to rewrite it. And she said, oh, well, OK, I'll give you two weeks. I said, two weeks? Even two months won't do it, but I'll try. And I had to run away to England and lock myself up in my club to uh, have the peace of mind and rework. And my granddaughter gave me back the dictionary, the French dictionary I'd given her. And then there was naturally this wonderful uh, thing, the computer with languages. I have two or three dictionaries in there, and that helped. But it was hard work. Did you, did you have to start over, or were you able to at least use that I one used for anything? They were, they were passages that were OK, but, but not much. Yeah. I had to rephrase a lot and even retranslate a lot and cut, 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 cut. She would have elaborate, you know, in French, in French they can really write with eight words what could be said in four and should be said in four. I, I like uh, terseness and economy. I think it's a quality in writing. So I really had to rework most of it. What is the most important thing about being an actor? And then I'd like to know also about a dancer. About being an actor, the most important thing is concentration. It's all about concentration. The great actors are the ones who are riveted on what they're doing. Uh, all of them. They're, there's just this complete concentration. They have left themselves in the dressing room and they are the, the personage, the character they're playing. Completely, absolutely completely. There's no room for anything else. That's great acting. Great dancer, I would say concentrate on the music and let the music guide you guide your, your movements, guide the beauty of the movements and the meaning of the movements. Have, uh, the movements must have meaning. And that's the great thing about Fred Astaire. The movements all have, there's a thought behind. Because you were a dancer, and in the course of your book, you mentioned um, Vladimir Kosma, Bronislaw Kaper, uh, Wojciech Kilar, just to mention my favorites. Oh, yes. Um, I, so I think the, that the music was perhaps more important to you, having been a dancer and having concentrated so much on that. Did you feel that? No, music doesn't come into acting. 
You you never have. Uh, no, but I but but when you see your films, finally. Yes. Uh, and the music is. I mean, you don't you don't have music until the film is done. Yes. But then, when you see the when you see the film, uh, the music is such an enhancement. <gasps> Definitely. And the lack of music is also an enhancement, with a great director. Uh, you also wrote about being thrilled to be dancing to Gershwin, who oh. you didn't know at the time who mm. he was. Well, there's, there's all his sense of humor and his wit, and that's what I like most in, in composers, wit and humor and intelligence. And uh, my favorites all have it, whether it's Stravinsky or Mozart or Gershwin. Do you think that there's a way in which dance can alter the creative process of acting? I'm afraid I think a lot of dancers... Uh, no, I'm afraid you have to forget your dancing when you're acting because it can make you uh, stiff and self-conscious. And uh, in, above all, in acting, you have to be loose. You have to let thoughts and emotions guide you. You cannot... Uh, the body follows. And good if you have body training and it will do whatever your thoughts command. But... Uh, of course, it's very good not to be to be able to do anything physically and to be able to throw yourself, run or, or fall or, or express things with your body, but it has to come from the heart and the head. Could you say whether you're an actor or a dancer first? Uh, definitely an actress. I was a dancer when I was very young, but now... And how did you get your first agent or manager? Uh, I didn't. He imposed himself on me. The studio, um, or Gene Kelly, uh, MGM, imposed MCA on me. And uh, I never... I, I was, somebody turned up and said, I'm your agent. And uh, and at that time, way, way back, being an agent was working for the studio, keeping the girl towing the line, keeping her doing what the studio wanted. It wasn't, he wasn't working for you, he was working for the studio. So when you left your MGM contract, did you get yourself an agent? I was still with that same MCA, I think. You know, I, I was pretty strongly, I was strong-willed, and I don't think I, I listen much. <laughs> and I don't think agents ever give you much advice. They don't. Uh, They give you sometimes some very strange advice. Uh, I've had agents tell me it's good for your career, yes. And I didn't listen. Like I turned down a film with uh, Gregory Peck. I should have done it, of course. And he said, it's good for your career, do it. No, I didn't think the script was good. I was right, it wasn't, but nevertheless. So tell me this, are, are you able to leave the role on the set at the end of the day, or do no. you take it home with you? <laughs> I, I take it home, and I think it probably is a good thing. I think d during the duration of the, of the film, you have to live 
as the character, more or less. And what qualities do you hope for in a director? I've had directors with very different personalities and styles. Uh, I would say, above all, someone who is uh, very interested in the subject he's doing, who's passionate about it. And I think that he could describe uh, the reason for making a film is to be really, really uh, very enthusiastic about it, otherwise don't make it. But there's that, and... Well, of course, I, above all, in, in a man, what I like is intelligence, or a woman. So intelligence, it's good if they're sensitive. I worked with one director who was not, and that was really a pain. But uh, I would say, and I'm not really, I don't really demand that he should know about acting. It's okay. I can manage that. That's my part of it. But, uh, Yeah, sensitivity, intelligence, and being passionate about your subject. As far as uh, your involvement with the Academy, uh, you've kept up your membership while living abroad. So, what does it mean to you? No, it's, it's actually quite the opposite. I wasn't a member, and I lived abroad, and I felt cut off from Hollywood. And I asked Neil Baer to use his, uh, I think it was Neil who used his influence to get me into the Academy. It means an enormous amount to me. It means I'm part of that uh, profession and that sort of fraternity. And I love have, having a little say into the films that are rewarded. And uh, I, of course, adore having the chance to see my film, to see the films in my, you know, in my room, uh, on my screen. And uh, sometimes I see it once and then I call a few girlfriends and ask them to come and see it again with me. And we have a superb time. I think uh, I'm just absolutely impressed by American films. I think they're better and better, better and better and better. More and more intelligent, because there's no doubt the first films pandered to very much lower uh, tastes. Uh, first films were made for the working class, for, for, you know, it, it just thought it was funny to see a train come into a station. And then, little by little, it took significance, and then it took political significance and social significance. And now they're, they have all those qualities. And I absolutely admire the... Uh, boldness of American films. They will treat subjects that are so far out and you think cannot be treated with uh, respect and I would say affection, but they are. And I think that's stupendous. That's so nice to hear. What, what would you say, what, what do you feel was the single most important contribution that the Screen Actors Guild made to the lives of actors? They defended actors, they defended their rights, and they have defended uh, their position, their situation financially, and, uh, and also their health. 
because before Screen Act, before the rules, I think they could work you uh, 18 hours, 20 hours out of 24, and you were burnt out. A, a girl passed it, he was simply burnt out. Uh, it's, I think those rules are extremely important, and uh, I think uh, also they have given homes to old actors, and that's magnificent, magnificent, because it's the loneliest business in the world, and uh, you work three months and then you don't know. You hope you'll be hired again, but you're not sure. And if you are, for some reason, out of, out of fashion, you don't suit the movement of the moment, you might be just completely abandoned on the wayside. Whereas Screen, screen Actors Guild does defend and protect, and also in the retirement, protect the actors. Could you say how your aspirations may have changed over the years? Mm, actually, no. I always wanted to do drama on the screen, and it, it took many, many years for me to have the right to do something dramatic. And uh, I, I simply love films. I, I still do exactly the same, and many different films. And uh, I am thrilled to be part of a film. Uh, I suppose I have gotten a little less demanding. I will be very thrilled to be a, a small part in a big film if it's a wonderful director and a wonderful story. story. But uh, mm, I think I have gotten, I have become more uh, bold and uh, have more assurance, self assurance, self assurance, and uh, that took a long time to come. And uh, also, I don't care so much about how I look anymore. Uh, if, when I became 40, it became a real anguish. And then when you reach 70, you think, what the hell, doesn't matter. What matters is the acting and uh, the emotion you portray, and, rather than the looks. But you feel very vulnerable when you hit 40, 40, 50, 60. What, what advice would you give to aspiring actors and or dancers? Learn the profession. Learn. Study. Go see a lot of films. And I, I well, I, I, as I said, the, the advice that uh, Warren Beatty gave me was absolutely terrific. You have to be preoccupied while you're acting. And the other advice I could give, and that I noticed very early on in my career, is that all great actors know how to listen. Um, Spencer Tracy was the greatest listener. Spencer Tracy did most of his career listening. Most of his acting was listening to Kate Hepburn <laughs> or someone else. He was a terrific listener. He invented listening. Early on, directors didn't think that the guy who listened was important. And they photographed the people, they were, they were on to the one who was talking. 
And then little by little they caught on that there was also a lot going on with the person who was listening. And that's something I learned from Spencer Tracy. And all great actors have that. Well, um, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you were starting out? To trust myself. And, well, that's something you learn with age about anything. About cooking, about <laughs> anything at all, about designing, about living. But unfortunately, you don't know when you start what you will know later. Well, there's a... <laughs> I think these are great answers. So, uh, finally, how would you like to be remembered? I don't think I will be remembered. I'm afraid one is forgotten very fast, and it's a good thing to remember that you will be forgotten very fast. I remember saying the word Gene Simmons some 10 years ago, and I was told who, and I'm sure they are Young people today, if you say Elizabeth Taylor, who? You know? If you had to single out a favorite role, could you, was there one role that you did that was your favorite? I was very, no, I would say there were three. There's, of course, Gigi, and there's Padre di Familia, and the L-shaped room. But, you know, I mean, one says that, but I'm absolutely thrilled with the part I played with uh, Cary Grant. It was absolutely wonderful. It was a Kate Hepburn part of a school mom, very uptight, and, and then she gets drunk, and she... <laughs> He forgets all, you know, behavior. She, she, she just. But I always think uh, the one I'm preparing is is going to be the best. Is the best. And I know you. You said you're learning a southern accent for the one you're oh, preparing. Oh gosh, yes. Can you tell us about what you're preparing? Yes, I'm, it's, I'm going to do in Laguna Beach Playhouse uh, six dance lessons in six weeks. And it is, I didn't realize when I first accepted the part, but then I, I had seen it with Claire Bloom in London, and I don't remember her taking a southern accent. Uh, then I asked, uh, I was considered, more or less somebody considered doing it in French, in France, and I read the script in French. And when I was offered to do it in Laguna Beach, I said, well, I've got to read the American script. So they sent it to me, and at first I didn't, and then very quickly, on the second or third reading, I thought, this is obviously a Southern woman. And uh, she even says she comes from North Carolina. So I thought there's only one thing to do. You've got to do the accent or else. I mean, you cannot play it. It's like playing in Gone with the Wind without an accent. You just simply have to. So I hope it'll be believable, but it's a lot of work. It's it's terrific fun. And when will it, when when is that? I've played happen? with Russian accents. I can do that very well because when I was a child, all my dance teachers were Russians, and I'm very good at that. But uh, a lot of uh, directors, I mean, old Hollywood didn't want you to take an accent. You were not 
<coughs> you were not allowed. Uh, they wanted your voice as... So, uh, I think it was thought that I couldn't take accents. I hope I'd, I'd make it. Oh, I'm sure you will. <laughs> I look forward to seeing it. When's it going to be? From Thanksgiving to Christmas to over Christmas. Oh, lovely. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much. I think your answers were superb. I really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you so much. Thank and you for the question. It's questions. a pleasure to be with you.